Hey guys, alright, so I had to change speakers. I'm gonna have to just end up buying, I'm gonna have to buy a spe another speaker. I don't know if my headphone jack is screwed up in my computer. I mean, it could be, which sucks, and I know why, but... Um, I'll probably just buy another Bluetooth speaker, one that has volume control on it. Anyway, for my notes just... really all right, I'm going to go ahead and do start chapter 17. I don't know if I'm going to get done with it. I might. I don't know. We'll just see. We're just going to jump right into it. This is fermentation, sauerkraut. And I'll probably just go ahead and use this picture for the front of the video. So, all right. Chapter 17, fermentation. My first foray into fermentation. My first experience with fermentation came from Sandor Katz, the author of Wild Fermentation and the Art of Fermentation, who was the keynote speaker for the Sustainable Agricultural Agriculture Conference put together by the Carolina Farm Stewardship Association every year. I attended Kat's workshop in an effort to interview him about his work and it, as, a, as part of From Scratch Magazine's coverage of the conference. I had a passing interest in fermentation at the time. I mean, who doesn't like home-brewed beer and wine? Um, beer? No. Wine? Yes. Beer? Gross. During the class, Katz discussed the varied and rich history of fermentation. According to Katz, fermentation is just as much a part of human culture as agriculture. If not more so, it is a method of processing food to make it edible, a method of food storage, and a method of, for personal health care. I, in, I sat enraptured as Kate's, Katz discussed is taking you back. Hmm. Back. the beautiful history and fascinating science behind the alchemy that is fermentation. By the time it was over, Katz was my guru. I was his disciple. The art of fermentation was my Bible. I interviewed him after the class, and he revealed his personal history and how fermentation led him to better health and a more nu nuanced spirituality. I went home and immediately started making sauerkraut the sand or cat's way. I chopped up three heads of cabbage, adding salt to taste, massaged it, packed it into mason jars, and waited. Three days later, after diligently burping it every morning, I cracked open a jar and tasted my magical creation. It was awful. During the process of salting the kraut by salting it to taste, I had overdone it. Instead of a pungent, slightly salty, delicious treat, the sauerkraut tasted like a salt lick. Of course, I did not blame Guru Katz, as his methods were merely the wine poured into an imperfect vessel. I went back to the art of fermentation and decided to actually follow a recipe this time. Instead of salting it to taste, I found it was best to use about two tablespoons of salt for every three heads of cabbage, which is still a little too salty for my wife. The second batch oh, was divine. I ate it for every meal, eggs and sauerkraut for breakfast, turkey and sauerkraut sandwiches for lunch, you get the idea. I even used it as a palate cleanser between dinner and dessert. I still process as many fermented foods as possible, but the sheer longing my body has for these powerhouses of mic microbial activity means I hardly ever have any in the house. But that one-hour course has led to an obsession, and I don't expect it will let up anytime soon. Fermentation takes cooking and turns it into a mad science or magic. And there's the fermentation jars right there with the, the fermentation lids, I should say. What is fermentation? Fermentation, simply put, is the process wherein microbes, yeast, and bacteria mostly turn the carbohydrates in all sorts of food into acid or alcohol. The process also produces, ga produces gases like carbon dioxide and methane, but most of these are considered byproducts and are not usually used, but these gases often produce desirable outcomes. In bread, the carbon dioxide produced by yeast makes the end result soft and fluffy. In the case of wine, beer, and sake, yeasts turn the carbs into alcohol. In the case of acids, bacteria takes foods like cabbage and turn it into kraut. 
Other common foods that are fermented are vinegar, kimchi, salami, chocolate, vanilla, bread, and yogurt. A bit about botulism. This is important. Botulism is one of the biggest fears most people have when it comes to fermentation. It's mostly unfounded. Botulism has, has to have an ultra-low oxygen environment in order to grow and thrive. Because items like sauerkraut, kimchi, and other lactobacillic fermentations are exposed to oxygen, it is nearly impossible for the botulism bacteria to grow in these products. Essentially, the bacteria and fungi responsible for fermentation are introduced into a food, think yeast into bread dough, and given an environment that encourages them to grow and flourish. As part of that expansion of microbial populations, this helpful little, the helpful little germs consume a portion of the food, breaking down molecules of proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. The fermentation process goes back to the Neolithic period, which puts fermentation in contention for the earliest food technology created by humans. In fact, fermentation was so important to humans, there is a well-supported belief among archaeologists and anthropologists that agriculture, responsible for the beginning of human civilization, bleh, was spurred by early humans' desire to produce beer, a theory backed by a paper published in 2012 by researchers at the Simon Fraser University in Canada. The process allows those that, who consume the food to get more nutrition and calorie content, and in the case of beer, wine, meat, and other spirits, produces satisfying side effects. Additionally, the consumption of fermented food helps supply the human digestive system with beneficial bacteria, which can help shield the system from disease, parasites, and other pathogens. In fact, cats who was diagnosed with HIV in the 1980s, told us during his interview he credits his continued good health in part to his high levels of consumption of fermented foods. Now, I definitely believe that. Fermentation also provides an excellent method of long-term storage. When talking about cheese, another fermented product, my father used to say, cheese doesn't go bad, it just gets better. Fermentation essentially uses good microbes to pre prevent bad microbial growth which is what causes food to spoil. As a result, fermentation was one of the first food storage methods. While I love home canning, I love home fermenting even more. And I'm definitely going to be getting into it. I'm going to try to see if I can start, hopefully, being able to afford getting the bulk 50-pound bag of the... Uh, yeah, Redmond's Real Salt in the bulk package. Sauerkraut and beyond. If you're interested in fermenting, you should be aware that you can ferment nearly everything. I mean everything. And one of Doug and Stacy's videos, I think from a couple of years ago, uh, I think the title of it is I Fermented My Entire Garden Harvest or something like that. Do you need to pull that up and listen to it again? I've fermented everything I could conceive of. Cabbage, kimchi, Meyer lemons, limes, green beans, sourdough starter, green tomatoes, cheese, yogurt, basically anything you can eat. I even made vinegar from fruit scraps. I haven't done eggs or meat yet, but as both usually require a bit more prep work. But there's a recipe for 100-year-old eggs I'm dying to try. Is it necessary to inoculate? In most cases of fermentation, you have to inoculate your food. See chapter 16 regarding yogurt. In the case of sauerkraut and most lactobacillic fermentation, you don't have to inoculate your food as the bacteria that ferments these products naturally exist on almost everything. Fermentation takes cooking and turns it into a mad science or magic. In a way, you're taking fundamental forces of nature, microbial metabolism and using it to prepare food it feels like cooking with the universe as your stove for the most part i stick to bacterial fermentation other types of fermentation cheese making yogurt making sourdough are discussed in other chapters as far as alcohol fermentation this tends to require more time than i normally have I've fermented beer and wine but so far producing a consistent product is beyond my ability i've 
included a great book on alcohol fermentation in the list at the end of this chapter if you're interested. I might look at that, but I'm definitely not interested in fermenting beer. Yeah. All right. The easiest way for most Americans to begin fermentation is to start with sauerkraut, and that's what I'm going to start with. The ingredients are cheap and readily available, and most of the equipment can be found in the average home. It's also a great introduction to the foibles and fears that most people have about lactobacillic fermentation, including mold formation. I'm trying to hurry up and get through this because I've got to be at work at two, so troubleshooting. The biggest issues most people have with lactobacillic fermentation are mold and saltiness. When I first started out, I used way too much salt. Fermentation tends to magnify the taste of salt, the salt taste of foods. So if you happen to accidentally put too much salt in, you'll definitely notice when you taste your kraut. In the, if the salt content is low enough, you can rinse the kraut and reduce the salt taste. If it's too high, your best bet is to toss it in the compost. Mold tends to frighten most people. As long as the mold isn't black, you don't need to be concerned. Blue or white mold is generally safe, barring a compromised immune system or allergy for human consumption. So if you see if you see it on the top of your kraut, scoop it off, add more brine. If you see black mold, toss the kraut and start over. If you have trouble with too much mold, you may have detergent residue inside your crock. Dish detergent kills bacteria, but since you're using bacteria to faci facilitate fermentation, detergent residue inside the container can stunt the growth of, ba of the bacteria, which could lead to the establishment of mold colonies inside your ferment. To avoid this, make sure you rinse your crocs and bowls well. Resources. If you'd like to learn more about fermentation, check out these books. The Art of Fermentation and Wild Fermentation by Sandor Katz. I'll probably go ahead and get these books. The Mini Farming Guide to Fermenting by Brett Markham. Markham. How to Brew Everything You Need to know everything you need to know to brew beer right the first time well definitely not that one and then the joy of home winemaking terry a gary and probably look that one up but the beer forget it chlorinated water and iodized salt most fermenters and recipes called for call for unchlorinated water that's why you don't want to use your tap water and non-iodized salt sea salt kosher salt pink salt etc the redmond's real salt is a great one to use the idea behind both is to make sure you don't retard the growth of bacteria in the ferment. Chlorine and iodine both kill bacteria. Iodine and salt, however, probably isn't strong enough concentration to kill bacteria. As far as chlorinated, chlorinated water, boiling it for a minute or two should be plenty to remove the chlorine in it. I've used both iodized salt and chlorinated water before when I didn't know any better. The kraut I made turned out fine that time. Other times, not so much. If you do use chlorinated water and iodized salt, your ferment will probably be fine, but since you want to maximize the chances of bacterial growth in your ferment, you should avoid chlorine and iodine. So Redmond's Real Salt is probably the best option for your salt. The Himalayan pink salt is a good idea, sea salt, that kind of thing. And stay away from tap water, just stay away from the chlorinated water, it's just bad. All right, I'm just going to put this in here. I'm not going to do this separately. Sauerkraut. Equipment. Clean mason jars with rings and lids, large crock or bucket, no metal, no metal. Large towel, and you want to stick with, like, your ceramic. You don't want, I wouldn't use plastic either. Food grade, probably. One gallon Ziploc bag, glass or plastic bowl. Ingredients. Three medium heads of cabbage. Two tablespoons of sea salt. Directions. Number one, first cut the cabbages into quarters, then cut the core of the, out of the base of the cabbage. Next, chop the cabbage into strips about a half inch wide. Some kraut makers use a grater for this process, but I like to cut, I like my kraut to have a big crunch to it. Put the chopped cabbage into a glass or plastic bowl. Never use metal, as the metal can react to bacteria in the cabbage, killing it. Number two, add the salt to the cabbage. Some kraut makers layer the salt as they put it in the cabbage. I just dump it in and start stirring. Use your hands, clean hands, to continue the salt, to combine the salt in...
bleh, sorry, I lost my place, to combine the salt into the cabbage. Then start squeezing the cabbage. Just grab big fistfuls and squeeze. This mechanically pulls moisture from the cabbage leaves. The salt chemically pulls the moisture from the cabbage, from the cabbage leaves through osmosis. The longer you squeeze the leaves, the more moisture you'll pull out. You are finished juicing your cabbage when you squeeze a handful and it produces about as much moisture as a wet sponge. Number three. Put the cabbage in the crock or bucket, again, ceramic, plastic, or glass, no metal. If you use plastic, make sure it's food grade. Number three, put the cabbage, okay. If the cabbage juice does not cover the cabbage leaves in the crock, make a brine of two tablespoons of salt to one quart of non-chlorinated water and put in enough to cover the leaves. Number four. Open the Ziploc bag and place in the crock. Place it in the crock. Fill the bag with water until the weight of the water pushes the cabbage leaves deeper into the into the crock and increases the water level. You want the weight of the water to push the brine about one inch past the cabbage leaves. Close the bag tightly and let it sit. Number five. Cover the entire crock with a large cloth or towel tying it off. Then put the crock in a somewhat cool location out of direct sunlight. In about three days, you should have a pretty good, um, excuse me. And a bug trying to get into my apple cider vinegar drink. In about three days, you should have a pretty good kraut. Taste the kraut and see if it's sour enough for your liking. If not, recover the kraut and let it sit longer. How long depends on you. Most people tend to tend to ferment for a few weeks, sometimes a month. My personal record for fermenting on the counter is eight weeks. Number six, once it's fermented to your taste, take it out of the crock and pack it into mason jars. Cap it off with the lids and rings. Plastic lids that fit into mason jars work well for this sort of project, as kraut doesn't have to be sealed. Store the jars of kraut in the fridge. This doesn't stop the fermentation process, but it slows it down greatly. Eat it as often as you can. And that was the end of Chapter 17 on fermentation. And I will go ahead and get this up there and... Definitely won't have enough time for another video, but I will get this up there and... I'll just end up having to do another video Monday because tomorrow's Sunday, unless I do one tomorrow night. Because I gotta work tomorrow. But Sundays. Yeah, Sundays I just don't have time in between church and uh, work, so. Oh, I'm tired. I didn't want to get up. Anyway, so I'll go ahead and get this up there and I will see you guys in the next video. Go ahead and look those books up. And soon we're going to be, like, through this book, and I'll be into the appendices, and I'll make sure I, you know, highlight those books and that kind of thing. So, I will see you guys in the next video. Remember to do your research, guys. Do your research. And if you find out something new, leave a comment and let me know. Because like, I'm soaking up this information myself. So, I will see you guys in the next video. Bye, guys.